It would be useful tonight to read you three excerpts from Earning It that are all tales of courage of one kind or another from different women at different stages in their careers as well as different stages in their ages. So the first story I want to share with you comes from the oldest woman that I interviewed for the book, a woman whose name is Charlotte Beers. She was a brash trailblazer in the advertising business who came to be known as the Queen of Madison Avenue. And she felt that her gender actually helped her to succeed. And it actually did early in her career in the advertising business. She later went on to become the first female leader of Ogilvy & Mather Worldwide, which is a multinational advertising agency. And the billings grew substantially during her five years there. And she later wrote a book called I'd Rather Be in Charge, a legendary business leader's roadmap for achieving pride, power, and joy at work. And several times early in her career, she figured out ways to turn sort of negative attitudes towards women to her advantage. But the courage story that I want to share with you about Charlotte happened when she found herself ill-prepared for being sexually harassed by a senior executive at a major client of Tatham, Laird, and Kudner which was a small, struggling ad agency that named her as its first female chief executive in 1982. Trying to turn it around, the agency landed a $20 million account with a beer brewer, which in the 1980s was a lot of money. In fact, she said it was the biggest new client we had ever had. The agency had spent six months trying to get that account and they edged out nine other agencies. So Charlotte immediately accepted an invitation to dinner with a top officer at the brewer, even though he wasn't in charge of advertising and she didn't know him. She wondered in retrospect, why would he invite me to dinner? She didn't bother to look into that. She now thinks that this beer baron wanted to check out the only female executive at her agency. She met the man at the Elegant 21 Club, where he had been drinking with his buddies from the liquor industry, probably some of the same guys who are making that booze we were just hearing about from Mark. They got in a car to drive to a restaurant for dinner, and en route, the executive announced that he had to stop at his employer's residence at the Helmsley Hotel and get some documents he wanted to review with Charlotte. Of course, that was just a ruse. You know what, the man said? You should come up and see our company apartment. It's been amazingly redone. Beers agreed, thinking to herself, well, you know, the guys back in the office will be gaga. I got to go to this famous beer company's private apartment in the Helmsley. So she and the executive boarded a private elevator. I noticed, she recalled, that he was swaying. And I thought, oh my God, I made a mistake. This man is drunk, terrified. She just realized at that point that her companion reeked of alcohol and I started getting a high panic, she said. They got off the elevator and stepped into a pitch black apartment. They couldn't find any lights. The man nudged her into a corner, and Charlotte stumbled over a bed, and the heavyweight executive then jumped on top of her. Charlotte, by the way, is not a huge woman. She put her hands on his massive shoulders and said, you don't want to do this, she remembered. And I shoved, she said. I didn't have any hope of making much progress, but in fact, he rolled off of me like a little ball. I think he was suddenly just brought to his senses. So he rolled over to the side of the bed and he began sobbing. Shaking all over, the frightened CEO fled the apartment. 
But then she had a fresh dilemma. Should her ad agency drop the account? She woke up her male colleagues with a late night call to tell them about her frightening encounter. They were furious. Remember, these are all guys. The agency's single biggest account was not worth keeping, some of these associates argued. That's ridiculous, Charlotte replied. We worked too hard for this. She felt personally responsible for her own bad judgment, as well as the fact that she was responsible for everyone else at the agency. After a sleepless night, she got up at 6 the next morning and she called the executive. She was ready to test her own leadership philosophy of quid pro quo, which involves offering someone respect and generosity during a difficult situation. You have to make yourself uncomfortable to their advantage, she noted to me. She wanted to preserve, however, her agency's relationship. So, I needed to not have him be frightened into creating a defense, she explained. As she spoke to him on the phone, she gave him no hint of her anger over the incident. She said, you know, you were not yourself last night, but obviously I can't work with you anymore. It would be uncomfortable for both of us. Recalling their exchange more than three decades later, she went on, and you know what? I say to him, I have a solution. And then I name a guy who's going to take over the account. Oh, that's a good solution, the guy said with a relief. Then <clears throat> Charlotte pledged to the executive to never discuss that evening again. And she said, to me, if I can overlook what is a very serious indiscretion on his part, then he can guarantee the successful evolution of the business. And that is exactly what happened. But I said to her, some people might question why you would keep this account. Is there any kind of moral to this story for contemporary women who still continue to face sexual harassment in the workplace? And she said, well, you can outthink any man who is on the move. They're afraid of getting caught. But in her own case, she blamed herself for not having a ready defense against this beer baron. Because you know what? She thought of herself as the mighty CEO. I thought I was impervious. And the message to women is whether you're a CEO or not, is you are never impervious to the unwelcome sexual advance. Now I'm going to take a drink of water if I can find my water bottle. So that was my first courage tale. At the point when I interviewed Charlotte, she would never admit how old she was, but I went and looked it up online. Um, this was last year, and she was 79. My second courage tale is to me one of the most inspiring tales in this book. It involves my chapter called The Pain of the Pay Pinch. And I wrote, money talks, especially for young women who start out with little money. Diane Bryant, I said, now a well-paid Intel executive. In fact, she's now the highest ranking woman at Intel grew up hoping that a decent wage might someday enable her to escape a dangerous home life and support herself. Bryant was raised in Sacramento, California as the daughter of an abused homemaker and a violent ex-convict. Her father had spent five years in San Quentin prison for armed robbery before she was born. And then he bounced from job to job while Diane and her sister were young. She told me he was always in and out of jail. One time, their father beat her mother so badly that she lost her hearing in one ear. And, Diane said, he had us all emotionally terrorized 
frequently threatening to kill us. Her mother tried to flee the home, but she and her daughters never went far because her mother had no money of her own. She did not work outside the home. I told myself, Diane said, I would never be financially dependent on another person. And as she spoke, her words poured out in a nonstop staccato. Unfortunately, she had to fulfill her own pledge sooner than she expected because her father decided to stop supporting her on the day she turned 18. On that birthday, she drove home from high school in her tiny Volkswagen. She remembered, everything I owned was on the front lawn. Her father stood outside with her mother sobbing nearby. Whatever you can fit in your car, you can take, he announced. And whatever you can't fit is mine. One item that Diane couldn't fit in the car was the orange 10-speed bike she had bought and she treasured. I, I had to leave it, she said, her voice quavering with emotion. I had to leave a lot of stuff. Gypsy-like, she moved from friend to friend until she finished high school four months later and got her own apartment. I still had a long row to hoe to financial independence and success, she added, but I was motivated to get a degree that paid a lot of money. Enrolling at a junior college, she had to squeeze in her classes between three jobs as a waitress and a hostess. A fellow calculus student told her that she could e earn a decent living if she majored in engineering and went to a four-year school. He said, you know what? You can make $30,000 with a degree in engineering and a bachelor's degree. She had no idea what an engineer did, but it sounded like smart advice. There's another part to that story that I didn't include in the book, which was she then had to go to the career services office and declare her intent to get that bachelor's degree. And so the career services office person said to her, okay, what kind of engineer do you want to be? A software engineer or a hardware engineer? And Diane absolutely had no idea what the difference was, but she said to me that software sounded more feminine, so she said, software. She joined Intel, which is a giant maker of semiconductors, indeed, as a $30,000 a year electrical engineer in 1985. Today, you can look at the proxy statement that comes out every year for Intel and see how she has paid a multi-million dollar annual package of cash and stock awards and is now the highest ranking woman at Intel. In fact, there were a number of women like this that I met in reporting my book. They accomplished financial independence that far exceeded their wildest fantasies. Another woman, for instance, Gracia Mortore, who went on to become the chief executive of Gannett and now runs Tegna, which was part of the breakup. She's the daughter of a builder who died before she even completed high school. And her first job after graduation was a bank management trainee, making $8,500. And I go on in that chapter to talk a lot about the gender pay gap and the fact that a study that only came out a year ago said that a typical working woman loses more than $530,000 over her lifetime due to the gender wage gap. And for those of you who are thinking that your attendance at this institution of higher learning will protect you against that, I have some bad news for you. Those losses are even greater for those with higher levels of education. My third story has to do with another woman I interviewed for the book who was among the two-thirds of the women I interviewed who went on to become public company chief executives. And this is a story about what happened when she went on a corporate board. And I point out 
that corporate boards greatly value collegiality. Now that can be good news and bad news for women with high aspirations. Female newcomers rarely fit in quickly in a boardroom, especially when they represent a significant minority. Women directors also frequently say very little during their first year. And as a result, that makes their colleagues slow to acknowledge their credibility and their expertise. Anne Stevens is an exception. I didn't realize that you just didn't jump in and get engaged, she recollected. And she is the former chief executive of a company called Carpenter Technology. And so she demonstrated that she had the right stuff after she made her debut as a corporate director. And she did that by taking an unusual flight in a fighter aircraft that was built by Lockheed Martin Corp, which is the biggest military contractor in the United States. Trained as an engineer, oh by the way, she started out as a nurse and then went back to school and got an engineering degree, and then hired by Ford in 1990, Stevens was vice president of North American vehicle operations for the automaker by the year 2002. At that point, an executive recruiter contacted another Ford executive about joining the Lockheed board because they wanted to have a second woman on that board. However, this woman, who was a marketing and sales specialist, proposed Anne instead because Lockheed wanted an operating executive, which Anne was. So she was chosen and she dined with the Vice President of Human Resources for Lockheed at a restaurant in Bethesda, Maryland, weeks before her inaugural board meeting in October of that year. In discussing Lockheed aircraft, the HR executive described the test flight that he had taken in its F-16 Fighting Falcon. Wow, that's real exciting, Stevens exclaimed. Would, would you like to go up in an, an F-16? The executive asked. And he pointed out that the other board members had spurned his invitation. But Stevens said she jumped at the chance for the flight because she had driven race cars and she was fascinated by the fa fighter's aircraft technology. So the flight was scheduled for spring of 2003. She passed a physical exam and underwent training to cope with an emergency in the two-seat jet, only two places in the jet. And she explained to me, you have to learn to eject in case something happened because if the pilot has a heart attack, you're up there and there's no place to go but down. She took a seat behind the pilot as the F-16 prepared to ascend. So, he asked, do you want to do a performance takeoff? Stevens agreed. It's where he said, you sort of go straight up like that, but everybody on board is upside down, she told me, waving her palm high in the air. So they're going straight up, but everybody in the plane is facing downward. And as they got in the air, she said, we did loops, we did rolls. And she described the flight. And the pilot even let her take over the controls for about 15 minutes. And as they flew what are called G-forces, which I thought I always knew, but when I heard this story, I had to go online and look it up, which is basically the force of gravity inside the aircraft started to intensify. So during a rocket launch, those astronauts that are strapped inside that rocket ship normally undergo a maximum of three Gs. So that would equal three times the force of gravity that humans are exposed to on Earth. And what happens is that high levels of G-forces can harm the body. And at nine Gs, most people black out 
or vomit. And now, as somebody who used to throw up on planes when I was a little girl, I don't think I could have done any of this. Any case, so remember, it's three Gs when the astronauts are taking off. The pilot pulled five Gs, I wrote. You want to go for nine, he asked her. Sure, she replied. I mean, talk about courage. The pilot later said he had never seen a woman passenger sustain nine Gs during F-16 test flight. Anne suffered no ill effects. In fact, she said, I loved it. After I came down, two other board members went up. And when those two men, of course, showed up at the next board meeting, they told her, we took the flight, but we couldn't do nine Gs. You're the only one who could do nine Gs. Not surprisingly, Anne believes that her performance aboard the F-16 bolstered her standing in Lockheed's boardroom, especially since some male members were military veterans who had flown fighter jets during war battles. They saw me as a risk taker, she said, courageous and technically competent in a traditionally male activity, more adrenaline seeking than expected. So what was the lesson for women who might want to get on boards? Well, speaking broadly, Anne encouraged novice female directors to cultivate a reputation as a valued contributor by sharing relevant business experience with other board members and getting to know them as individuals. She took her own advice, by the way. To that end, she arranged breakfasts and dinners with her Lockheed board associates right after she arrived. And she said to me, the guys were really great. But in my mind, it was Ann Stevens who was really great to withstand nine Gs. Thank you.